Um, I'm Lauren Webster, one of the public health graduates who's been working on this project. So just whilst we get started, um, I'll just go over the safe places approach. Um, so this is in place throughout all of the webinars. Um, so the approach that we expect for our hosts and attendees, so respect, above all, we will respect each other. Empathy, so we will acknowledge the feelings, experiences and identities of those around us. Care, we will create non-judgmental caring spaces for people to be authentic. Support, so we will listen, empower and support each other. And inclusion, so we will include all LGBTQ plus identities and experiences to ensure that we actively create inclusive spaces for seldom heard people within the community to be heard and be seen. Um, I think the session's being recorded today, so if you don't want to be recorded, um, don't turn your camera on. Um, I can't see the chat at the minute, so if you do have any questions, um, I'll answer them at the end if that's okay. So just a bit of a background as to why we developed the framework. So back in 2022, we released the um, Birmingham and Lewisham African Caribbean Health Inequalities Review, which is back it for short, um, explored the health inequalities affecting African and Caribbean communities and the best way to address them and recommendations to break structural inequalities and achieve sustainable change. And um, the report had a thematic approach to considering health inequalities and it drawed on the life course model and wider of health um, and explored 39 opportunities for action across eight themes. From this, there were seven key priority areas that were identified, which um, cultural um, competency, which was included, um, all under the theme trust and transparency. So um, as part of the review, it called for cultural competence training of health and social care professionals, professionals which was led to be led by NHS integrated care systems and the councils. So building oh, steady on. Um, so building from the key priority area, trust and transparency, there has been an exploration of how to strengthen, create, and improve cultural competency using evidence-based co-produced approach. Um, so from this, we led two, two pillars for action. So the first one being cultural intelligence, which was aimed at managers, leaders, and those working with specific communities, and cultural humility and safety, which was aimed at everyone. So humility and safety, um, we'll just touch briefly on today, but we're focusing on the cultural intelligence side. So humility and safety focuses on cultural competency at an interpersonal level, whereas the cultural intelligence is focused at strategic leadership and population level. Both of these are important to develop and support. Um, cultural community and safety training should be mandatory for everyone to develop a core skill set and um, whereas cultural intelligence then builds upon this which goes a step further to develop knowledge and understanding of specific communities um so just a quick overview of humility and safety. Um, so I'll just shorten it down to CHS because it's a bit of a mouthful. So CHS training aims to develop cultural competency in, in, at, at an interpersonal level um, through skills development to enhance interactions between staff and clients and patients. So it's really about sort of like that one-to-one -one, um, sort of communication. So CHS training is designed for everyone. So frontline staff, managers and communities. Um, so we recognise the lack of quality standardised CHS training on offer in Birmingham and the gaps in the evidence base. Um, BCCs then co-produce the cultural um, health and safety framework. Um, so it's a resource to guide the provision and commissioning of cultural humidity and safety training. So within the framework, it includes a skills and knowledge framework, commissioning specification and evaluation tool and a repository of good practice and evidence evidence-based core tools um, and you'll just see on the right hand side just sort of an overview of these areas. Um, we will have the um, EOI for this um, pilot available on the website soon so if you want to have um, a deeper look into it it should be on there but I'll link to it at the end. So sort of onto the main event. So this is the cultural intelligence framework. Um, so it's a training and development toolkit to help individuals and organisations build strength and, and evidence their deeper understanding and approach to enabling and empowering different communities of identity, of identity and experience. So as I mentioned before, it's mainly aimed at individuals in leadership and managerial positions, organisations working with specific communities of identity, and individuals who've already received cultural humility and safety training. Um, 
and within each domain um, or competency there is a lay and short description, a detailed cultural competency domain definition, an active activity resource mapping and a case study. And what you'll see on the right is sort of the the seven competencies and how you would work through them. We will just go into a little bit more detail and um, but you'd start curiosity understanding, maybe go down either the route of conscious decision making or allyship, then going on to advocacy, anti-discrimination and then finalising in the game changer. Um, but I'll touch on them a little bit more. Just to help with your understanding the difference between the two frameworks, this is sort of like a side by side comparison um, of the two. I won't go into sort of each thing in much detail, but um, you'll be able to see that the focus for intelligence is sort of on that strategy and policy development for specific communities, whereas humility and safety is sort of that interpersonal interactions, which is why we sort of advise doing community and safety first. So then you can build on that learning within the cultural intelligence. Um, the objectives for intelligence are developed Developing, strengthening and evidencing a deeper understanding and a, an approach to enabling and empowering different communities of identity and experience and then developing core skills for developing cultural intelligence across seven domains. Whereas with humility and safety, we develop the skills and confidence to develop a culturally humble mindset and engage in a culturally safe interactions with others. The formats are slightly different as well. So with intelligence, it's going to be self-directed learning using tools provided. It is con continuous learning and there is a flexible approach. So you are able to choose the specific communities to focus on and then the specific domains. Whereas with humility and safety, it is more skills based. So you would have um, a minimum half day training session plus self um, ongoing self-reflection. Um, and then the assessments are a little bit different. So competency and um, the competency assessment for intelligence is peer review and challenge and um, with humility and safety it's post course skills confidence and knowledge assessments um i think sort of the overall takeaway between these two is that um again culture humility and safety it's about that one-to-one -one interaction that you can sort of apply to everyone whereas when it comes to intelligence it's about sort of those specific communities and developing those specific skills um so sort of um making sure that you can apply what you've learned in humility and safety and um, to make sure that the um, actions you go on to make are sort of have that cultural intelligence to it. So how are we going to use the framework um, sort of within organisations? So um, we are pilot starting the pilot year of the um, cultural intelligence framework. When we plan to um, release this sort of on a wider scale, we will have resources for you know many, many different communities. However, because we are just piloting it currently, we've chosen to focus on 10 key communities. So we've got five um, ethnicity groups, two faith, two disability and one LGBT um, plus. Um, which is the trans community, which I'm going to focus on today because um, obviously it's LGBT History Month. Um, the reason behind why we've picked these groups is more because of sort of their relevance within Birmingham um, and also sort of, um, sorry, it's the, the relevance within Birmingham um, and sort of the resources available. So that's sort of where we've got um, the reasoning behind these groups. But as I said before, it is just the pilot year. So we are still, still building sort of the resources and um, to go with the wider rollout. So why the trans community in Birmingham? All the information on the screen are, is taken from our trans community health profile, um, which is linked. It's on the BCC website, which is developed by a wonderful communities team. So just an overview of sort of um, you know, what the trans community is like within Birmingham. So it's um, estimated to be just over 9,000 trans people in Birmingham, with Nichols having the highest trans MSOA population at 3.2%. Um, I want to draw your eye to the bottom three, um, which sort of is the relevance as to why you've picked the trans community for this and why they would benefit from you know, we us delivering cultural intelligence training, especially within healthcare. So between 2020 and 21, there was a 3% increase in transphobia hate crimes, with a total increase of 79% from 2012 to 21. So there's a clear um it is clear that there is a high levels of discrimination against a specific community. Um, and then 79% of respondents reported that the GB had little or no knowledge about gender dysphoria, regardless of how helpful they tried to be, with 16% of trans respondents reported feeling unsupported by their GP. This sort of shows why we're sort of 
including the trans community within sort of the, the initial pilot phase um, and why we're focusing on health care because they there is sort of a need for this cultural intelligence and this more dedicated training around it so i won't go into too much detail everything else but as you can see there is sort of a strong trans community within birmingham so the seven domains of competence um the framework has seven domains of practice that have been co-designed and developed using the research evidence base. Not all domains need to be completed for every community of identity. Individuals should decide what level is appropriate for them in the context of their local communities, their role and their interest. Organisations may set objectives for competencies as part of their internal strategies to develop cultural intelligence, especially at senior leadership levels. So we can see below the seven different um, competencies. So starting off with curiosity, so it's demonstrating that curiosity and engagement with the community of identity, its history and experiences. With understanding, so you're demonstrating this through reflective practice of the context, issues and experience of a specific community. We're building on that with allyship, so you're demonstrating empathy and appreciation of a specific community and their experiences and actively support visibility and recognition of the community. But then anti-discrimination, you demonstrate this through recognising discrimination and therefore deciding to act, becoming an active bystander and intervening to disrupt or to prevent the discrimination. Conscious decision making is then making strategic and professional decisions in the context of understanding of specific communities, the potential positives and negative impacts on those communities. And then advocacy, demonstrate advocacy through self-reflection, education, commitment to the empowerment of disadvantaged groups and taking action. But the final stage being game changer, so you demonstrate the ability to apply competencies to impact change in a significant way. We sort of expect people to be sort of on the left hand side um, with their training. So starting at curiosity and building on the understanding with Game Changer being quite a significant stage. We don't expect everyone to reach that end because that takes a lot, a lot of work. Um, you know, we're talking about like our Greta Thunbergs, Marsha P. Johnson. Um, there are sort of um, precautions we take with Game Changer. Every single um, Game Changer um, sort of reflective practice would need to be audited. Um, I'll go on to this a little bit further, um, but it's to sort of ensure that you know, because it's such a significant stage, we have taken precautions with that. Um, but you can sort of see how you sort of build on from those early skills with curiosity um, as you make your way through it to become sort of more active um, within your work. So how does someone move through um, the different competencies? So I briefly touched on that within each framework, we would provide um, a list of resources. These are just some of the resources we have at the moment for, tran for the trans community. But I would sort of really like to make clear, these aren't the final resource list um, and whether we are in just the pilot stage, they may not sort of represent every single lived experience. And we are sort of, in the stage now of going out to sort of um, specific community groups to sort of ask for their opinions and any resources that they would sort of recommend for us to use. Um, I would also say if anyone sort of in the call today um, has any suggestions, please feel free to reach out um, as you want to make sure that the resources that we are providing um, are representative of sort of this specific community. So. Going into the resources, um, I've just given two examples for each one. How it would work is that an individual would um, go and either use some of the resources that we provide or go and sort of do their own research um, and sort of take in sort of what they've learned from these resources. And obviously they are different for each sort of domain and you would only be able to use um, one specific resource for um, that domain or that community group because I know there is a little bit of overlap so you can see for curiosity and um, we're starting off with what does trans mean for Oxford University LGBTQ um, and understanding transgender people the basics from the National Centre for Transgender Equality and um, with allyship so we've got um, a really great piece from the Trans Unions Congress on how to be a good trans ally at work and Stonewall's Trans Allies programme and um, conscious decision making so creating a trans inclusive workplace from the Harvard Business School um, and then finally for the game changer we have given some examples of sort of when we've had those game changer examples we obviously can't give you the um, 
the exact way to sort of become a game changer I think sort of comes within yourself so we've got Marsha P Johnson's women's history sort of an example of someone who was a game changer and these resources are a mix of sort of um, knowledge based and skills based I think initially with curiosity and understanding you start with more sort of um, knowledge based to develop that understanding and then you move on to more skills based resources throughout. So how do we demonstrate that competency? For every domain activity completed, a reflective practice template must also be completed. Um, it is a method to reflect on your own learning, knowledge and experiences in order to improve the future. Um, and by spending time reflecting on our experiences and our reactions to the experience, we can identify opportunities to improve the future as well as any further opportunities for learning and development. So it uses a series of questions to help you to reflect on a specific experience or piece of learning um, and through answering these questions and spending time to analyse your own responses you can develop deeper insight into your own behaviours, knowledge and reactions and find out opportunities to improve the future. Reflective practice has been um, sort of used um, tool within sort of healthcare settings before but we do recognise for many that this is probably going to be a new skill. Um, on the right there are some example questions um, that we will be providing um, as part of the refractive practice templates and it just sort of shows you um, what someone using the framework would be looking at. So it's sort of asking questions of what have you learned, how did you feel about um, what you learned, was it a good what was good about the experience and also what was bad about the experience and then further questions sort of how would I how will what I experience change the way I behave in the future? And is there any further learning I need to develop this area further in any other reflections? Um, so it's sort of making sure that people are quite active in sort of what they've been, um, if the resources that they've been using to make sure that there is that sort of active learning um, throughout the process. So we are also asking for there to be peer, um, in essence a peer review within sort of organisations implementing the framework. Um, so it means that a random selection of reflective, pra reflective practice templates um, that have been completed will be reviewed by someone else and feedback would be provided to um, the user to help them improve the quality of your reflective practice and learning. So this peer review should not be able to see who complete the self-reflection templates so it would need to be anonymous. If through this audit there is insufficient evidence that the reflective practice templates have been completed in enough depth to demonstrate competency, then this would be discussed with you by your organisation's learning and development lead, and you would then need to resubmit them to maintain your competency and accreditation. And we are recommended that a minimum of 10% of reflection practice templates across an organisation go through peer review. So this is sort of an example of how um, using the framework would affect someone on like an individual basis. So we've used the allyship um, competency as an example. So Alex and Taylor are two colleagues who work at a tech company with Alex identifying as a cisgender male, while Taylor identifies as a transgender woman. Despite being highly skilled and competent, Taylor has experienced subtle forms of discrimination and microaggressions in the workplace and feels their perspectives are not given the same respect as others as a result of their gender identity. One day during a team meeting, they discuss the need to improve workplace diversity and inclusion, and Taylor raises their concerns and explains the effect that microaggressions and discrimination has on them. After hearing of Taylor's experiences, Alex is inspired to become an ally to the transgender community and so works through the cultural intelligence domain, starting the curiosity and understanding. Using the cultural intelligence toolkit, Alex identifies activities that he can do to deepen his understanding of what is meant to be an ally to the transgender community. So he starts by educating himself about what it means to be an ally and he signs up to join a skills based learning group with the Ally Lab, which is a collaborative group of peers geared around learning valuable skills of being an ally. And he learns skills such as active listening and how to build empathy effectively. Alex and his peers meet regularly and take part in role play to enable them to practice their skills and they then give each other feedback and discuss ways they can improve. Alex, enjoy these, Alex enjoys these sessions so he takes it upon himself to do extra reading and in his reflection um, he notes that he feels more confident and less afraid to make mistakes and recognises that making mistakes is the only way he's truly learned to improve his allyship skills. He feels more confident as a result of the skills he's gained, so he turns his attention to learning more about issues that affect the transgender community. So you can put these newfound skills to good use. He does this by reading articles and he attends a transgender awareness workshop offered by the Diversity Trust. And in this workshop, members of the transgender community share their experiences of everyday life. 
In his reflection, he notes that his eyes were open to some things that he takes for granted in his life, and he reflects on his privilege, the way that his behaviour perpetuates stereotypes, which motivates him to put his learning to good use. He now feels well prepared to open a dialogue with Ty with Taylor to get a grasp of their personal experiences that the issues he has learned about. After a fruitful conversation with Taylor, he notes down their main, some of their main concerns and discusses ways that he might be able to help, being sure to put his active listening skills into practice. He reflects on this conversation, is happy with how he puts his skills and learning into practice. And once Alex completed complete these activities, he submits his reflective practice note reflective notes templates to the organization's learning portal for review and assessment. Alex receives confirmation that he has successfully completed the allyship cultural competency and receives a certificate. And then as a result of completing his um, the cultural competency, Alex puts his learning into place by actively advocating for inclusive policies that address the needs and concerns of transgender employees. And in meetings, he is sure to ensure that Taylor is given the opportunity to speak on issues that affect her. When this does not happen, Alex feels comfortable speaking on behalf of Taylor and they collaborate with HR and senior management to create guidelines for respectful behaviour, gender neutral restroom, op restroom options and protocols to address discrimination. So this just sort of shows how um, someone may use the allyship competency um, to sort of help within their workplace. And then we've also included sort of on a wider level how an organisation could implement the framework. So for, in this example, an organisation would sign up to use the BCIF pilot and then a cohort of staff are involved in the framework and a designated BCIF officer would be assigned. And then staff agreeing with the line managers and coordinator which community to focus on and um, was also um, discussing which domains to focus on with a minimum of two being required. The organisation then also would in, uh, could include create a beast of champions which will commit to reaching six of the seven domains to sort of um, encourage people to take up the role and then organization would then agree to allow staff six designated hours for each domain to be achieved over six months staff use resource lists and own research and document their work in the reflective practice exercise and discuss with their managers in the one-to-ones and then staff submit reflective practice exercises to an online hr portal which allows them to stay non the designated BCIF officer peer reviews 15% of submitted reflective practice um, documents and participating staff are issued certificates for each completed domain from their organisation. So this is just an example of how it could be applied within an organisation. Obviously, it would depend um, and differ depending on each group, but it just sort of gives you an idea of how it would work. So the pilot. So why we've come to talk to you today. So we will be start we will start piloting BCIF in three to five Birmingham based organisations over 2024 and 25, and we'll also be commissioning external academic evaluation of the pilot to be undertaken concurrently with the findings to be published in summer 25. So we have just launched the EOI, um, and then the pilot, um, sorry, the evaluation EOI will be going um, live, and I think in a few weeks, and these will be closing in March. The objectives of these pilots include evaluating the effectiveness of the BCIF in supporting organisations in, in, and individuals to develop cultural intelligence, to build evidence of impact of implementing the framework on knowledge, attitudes, practices and behaviours of staff and organisations, to gather insights from the pilot to refine and enhance the BCIF and ensure its adaptability and relevance to various communities or identity and organisations, facilitate capacity building within participating participating organisations to implement the visa effectively and fostering a culture of fairness, inclusion and respect, measuring the impact of the BCIF on organisational practices, leadership approaches and community engagement, to use BCIF as an opportunity to partner with local, local organisations and build sustainable relationships and generate comprehensive documentation and insights to contribute to the body of knowledge on cultural intelligence and the cultural context of the people of Birmingham, influencing future policies and practices. So if you were interested in trialling um, BCIF within your organisation, what would that require? So you split that into three different sections, staffing, resources and communication. So with staffing, we would ask for a minimum of 10% of staff in an organisation or department to participate in using all or part of the framework, with a 15% um, minimum of reflective practice templates being peer reviewed and 25% of these to be externally peer reviewed for quality insurance. These 25% would be peer reviewed by our academic partner um, to be included within the, um, the final report. You would then have an identified um, BCIF coordinating officer within the organisation to oversee and support local implementation of the framework. 
the resource requirements. So you would provide, uh, you need to provide some learning resources, time and activities to support people to develop competencies. Defining working towards metrics of success for your organisation. So what are you looking to sort of achieve them from attending the pilot? Establishing a clear internal platform for knowledge and information dissemination. So, for example, it could be a section of the intranet um, and supporting communication engagement process to promote the framework. You would need to establish an electronic submission process with lecture templates to be submitted once completed for peer review. And then working with an external academic evaluator and the council to capture the required data learning and adapt based on the evidence during the year. Communication wise, we're asking for regular updates on project developments, milestones and relevant news through webinars and direct communication channels and monthly collaborative virtual meetings to discuss progress, address challenges and share best practices among partner organisations. So what can Birmingham City Council offer to you? This is um, an unpaid opportunity with the pilot. However, we are trying to support you as much as possible um, with sort of being at the forefront of um, sort of this new sort of era of diversity training. So we provide a new, we provide a named liaison officer within BCC to act as a key point of contact for the partner organisations during the pilot year pilot year alongside monthly partnership meetings, providing advice and support for partner organisations taking part in the pilot. We provide core training for peer review staff through virtual workshops and a menu of activities to support learning and competency development for each of the seven domains of practice for the pilot communities of identity. We would then also provide access to a range of virtual learning materials which organisations can use to supplement their local offerings. I mean, then we would establish a robust two way communication channel for partner organisations to provide feedback, ask questions and share insights. And then we would facilitate the external academic evaluation of the pilot phase, culminating in a comprehensive final report documenting outcomes, lessons um, and recommendations for future, future implementation. So this is just sort of the timeline of sort of the pilot year. Mm -hmm. So it's currently February. Um, so we have sent expressions of interest out to organisations for both the BCIF and the Cultural Community and Safety Framework um, with webinars such as this to communicate the offer. Um, the EOI's so expression of interest and evaluation tenders will close um, on the 31st of March and then going into April we will start reviewing applications and um, announcing partner selections for the pilot and the evaluation. May 2024, we're hoping to get the partnership agreement and the initial launch of the pilot. And then between June 24 and April 25, that's when the framework's been put into place in these organisations. So staff training and then the evaluation partner would start collecting data throughout. April and June 2025, that's when the evaluation concludes um, and then there is the dissemination of findings. So if you are interested, um, I have linked the expression of interest on Find It in Birmingham. And um, we are hoping to get this onto the website because we know that not everyone has access to Find It in Birmingham, um, with the closing date being the 31st of March 2024. We have produced two um, videos on the BCIF. So there is one video going into a bit more detail about sort of the different domains. So they'll have examples and um, a bit more sort of definition of them. So if you are interested, definitely go have a look at them. I promise they're not too long, but unfortunately it's me discussing them again. Um, and then we also also have videos on the cultural community and safety frameworks and um, so if you are interested in that we do have two more on that um, and I have linked that onto the slide um, and if you do have any questions please contact myself um, with, regarding the BCIF um, and I can try and have a conversation and just answer anything you do have so I think that is oh so this is just the QR codes for the events and the evaluation for the session and um, so please offer any feedback if you have time and um, there will also be the links to all the other sessions. So I'll stop.